Victor and I have come prepared today with our life jackets because we are looking at two absolute boats today. And we're seeing what you should be looking at if you're in the market for a full-size three-row luxury SUV that isn't a Cadillac Escalade. This is a 2024 Grand Wagoneer L Series 3 for about $148,000 Canadian or about $121,000 in the US. And this is the 2024 Lincoln Navigator Reserve right around 130,000 Canadian dollars and 106,000 USD. Let's go boating. Up first, we're looking at the 24 Grand Wagoneer L. This has a three liter twin turbo straight six engine producing 510 horsepower, 500 pound feet of torque and uses an eight speed automatic transmission. Specs wise between these two vehicles are pretty similar. I mean, they they both have full LED headlights on the exterior. They both have sequential light up sequences for the lights. They all look really good. Side steps deploy automatically. I mean, everything that you would want on a full size luxury vehicle is present on the exterior of these two, including all the safety tech. I mean, both of them have adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, blind spot monitoring, 360 cameras, but we will touch on some of the key differences with them in a second. But for the most part, you know, you're looking at a behemoth vehicles such as this the only difference between these two is we have the l for the grand wagoneer and we are going to be talking about how the long wheelbase version of the lincoln would compare we just don't happen to have it here it's just how press cars work we don't get to choose which vehicles are put on the press fleet so that's what we've got and also when it comes to the grand wagoneer we have 10 inches of ground clearance with the quadra lift air suspension you don't get the air suspension on the lincoln so beside the new kid in town, we get the dinosaur of luxury full-size SUV. Under the hood of the Navigator is a 3.5 liter twin turbo V6, putting out 440 horsepower and 510 pound-feet of torque. Power is routed through a 10-speed automatic transmission to all four wheels. With the max trailer towing package, you can tow up to 8,300 pounds, which is unfortunately a little over a thousand less than the Jeep. But on the other hand, this vehicle is a little bit cheaper even if you option for the L version, the long wheel base version. This will come in at 134,000 Canadian dollars or 109,000 USD, whereas the Grand Wagoneer is a little bit more expensive. It also has adaptive suspension with road preview. Unfortunately, it's springs, not air suspension. And then on top of that, you get one extra year of warranty over the Jeep. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the exterior, but we want to touch on the dimensions first. Believe it or not, again, if these were both long wheelbase vehicles, the overall length on the Grand Wagoneer is bigger. It's about 4.8 inches or about 12.3 centimeters longer overall. But the wheelbase is better on the Navigator by 39 millimeters or 1.5 inches big surprise there. But when it comes to the other dimensions, I was actually quite surprised when I was putting everything together. The Lincoln is a little bit shorter by about 2.3 inches. And then the headroom is better on the Navigator. You get two and a half inches of headroom on the front greater as well as one and a half inches in the second row. And then the front legroom is better on the Navigator by about 2.9 inches, which is really big. A lot of people, we get a lot of comments, you know, a lot of tall folks are, are yeah. asking us about this. So based on those numbers, the Lincoln Navigator is actually the way to go for that. Yeah, it seems like on the exterior, the Wagoneer, the Grand Wagoneer is a little bit bigger, yep. but a bit better use of space. Probably because there's the less interior stuff, in right? the Navigator. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. So, because I thought for sure that the Jeep was going to be way bigger in every other in a, every other dimension, and it is for everything else. I mean, you know, overall third head third row headroom, you get an extra inch, which is pretty good. If again, if you're putting adults into the back there, second row legroom is about an inch and a half better. Third row legroom is about half an inch better, and then the overall passenger volume almost the same. It's only 27 milliliters difference, so very little, uh, but it's third row cargo that is about 280 milliliters better on the Grand Wagoneer. So that's if the third row is completely upright, you have more room. And again, the B-roll you're seeing here, the na Navigator is not the long wheelbase. We're using long wheelbase numbers so that we can even it out. But let's talk about the looks because you know they're obviously, right away you can tell that these are full-size SUVs. I'm really leaning towards the looks of the Grand Wagoneer, but there's quite a difference between the two, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. The The Navigator is full on conservative uh, yeah. direction, right? This hasn't really been updated for a very long time. Even with the refresh that they did a couple of years ago, 
it was only it made mainly the infotainment system yeah. so everything else still looks very traditional and very conservative whereas this is a brand new vehicle from 2022 i believe and so everything is pretty much brand new in this car um the design is very modern let's put it that way yeah. whereas this one it's even a little bit of uh, early 2000s sort of design from the exterior. So yeah, exterior looks, the back ends I, I think are also quite unique. Yeah. Um, with the, the Wagoneer here, we've got sequential turn signals on the front of the back. I think it looks really cool. And then the rear end, you know, it's one of those love or hate kind of things. It's very flat. You know, there isn't a ton of detail in the back, but what I think really helps to elevate the Grand Wagoneer over the Lincoln is the tint on the windows. It's almost like a, a copper tint to it. So it kind of adds to that copper design throughout the badging of the vehicle. Whereas the Lincoln, it's it's elegant, but it's just very simple. Yeah, I do really like that uh, even the Grand Wagoneer logo here is chrome, but bronze on the side, yeah. which really makes a, a bit of a different approach to, to just traditional chrome everything, right? And that's what's good between the two, right? You've got some choice, whereas, you know, if you're looking for a sportier option, Escalade. But if you're looking for, yeah, again, more modern than the Grand Wagoneer may be. And if you're looking for a classic, less in-your-face look. Than or the if Lincoln's you're retired. Car. Or you're retired. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Well, I mean, really, you're going to have to be retired to afford any of these vehicles. They're so expensive. But, yeah. but they are quite different. That You know, they do cater to slightly different buyers, which is why it's so important to feature them. Yeah, absolutely. If in a Navigator like this... I feel like, you know, I've worked my whole life in an F-150 or F-250 and now it's time to retire and I've saved up a chunk of money for my retirement and this is something that I would get into yeah. instead of this, obviously. For sure. Because it's a Ford, right? Yep. A Ford product. So there is a, a niche demographic for each of these yeah. vehicles, which we're going to explore a little bit more when we jump inside which we should do now because the wind is only picking up. So let's start off with the Grand Wagoneer and then we'll finish up with the Navigator before we hit the road and talk about how these vehicles drive, ride and perform and everything else you need to know if you're in the market for essentially a house. Let's do it. All right, so here's some of the reasons why you're gonna to wanna to consider the Grand Wagoneer. First off, we have over 75 inches of screen in this vehicle. There is a 12.3 inch screen in the cluster, a 12 inch infotainment you running Uconnect 5 in the center stack, plus another screen below it for all of your controls like the front seats, the rear seats, the massaging function. You have a 10 inch screen for the co-pilot, which can control things like the rear media screens, as well as be able to send directions and stuff to the driver. We have a digital rear view mirror and we've got the two Uconnect theater screens in the second row, along with a screen in the center console to be able to control the airflow for the seats back there. So there's a lot going on. Now the front seats have heat, ventilation, massage, and memory. And the second row, Victor will talk about in a second, but not quite as equipped as they are in the other vehicle, but we have tri-zone automatic climate control. Third row seats are comfortable on this L. I can fit back there. Not only that, I'm comfortable. And then really, I mean, the other things that make this vehicle stand out, I like the fact that everything is soft touch. We've got leather on the top. We've got this metal finish trim, which is an upgrade on this vehicle for about $1,000. The Grand Wagoneer is embossed into it. I think it looks quite spectacular. And then we've got all the controls. There's a lot of buttons, tons and tons of buttons. All your HVAC controls are buttons. You've got buttons to be able to open up the screen area. The second screen here pops open so you can get to your HDMI input, your USB, your wireless phone charger. All of that works very well. Cup holders, console, and then underneath here, in the armrest, a fridge, as you would expect, at $150,000. The only downside is the HUD. Small HUD gives you a little bit of information, nothing over the top, but it is pretty functional. So for the most part, you're getting a very comfortable interior, suede headliner, all the features, nothing's really missing from this. So let's talk with Victor in the second row. All right, so in the second row, I'm quite comfortable. I mean, these seats are pretty nice. I just do wish that these seats are a little bit wider because, you know, you have this huge center console here, which is which looks really grand and nice. But I wish it was a little bit narrower and the seats are a little bit wider. And then next up, you get a screen here to control your climate control for the rear. You get ventilated seats and heated seats in the second row. But that's about it of what you can do with this screen. Now, you also have 
TVs up front, which is nice. You get a controller here. You could, you know, watch Disney Plus or whatever if you if you have the internet connection. And then the center console, huge. I can hide in here basically. Um, and then sun shades, which is really nice. Uh, obviously, in the second row, you want something like this if if you're driving along the coast of California. Let's put it that way. And then a 23 speaker Macintosh sound system, which sounds pretty nice. Not the best in class, I would say, but decent enough. I don't have any complaints about that. Now, in front here, you get your USB chargers, both USB A and USB C, which is nice. And then you also get a household charger here, which also works great. And then, aside from your suede headliner, in the third row, you also actually get an extra sunroof, which really opens up the space and really makes the third row very comfortable to sit in. And it's basically a second row in the back. So you'd expect exactly the same comfort and space and, and openness in the third row as you would in the second. Now, of course, getting into the third row, you also get a nice little button that's electric. You just press the button and the seat moves forward. So easy in and out. Aside from that, finally, you could option with a bench seat as well if you don't want this giant center console. All right. We're in the Navigator now, and the interior is a sandstone interior, which means that it has dark brown and beige combination. This interior is really nice because it really elevates the interior from a black interior, but it's, not, but it's also not over the top like a red interior or anything like that. I think it's subtle enough to feel very luxurious. Now, of course, alongside with those leather you have a bunch of wood trims here which also feels great and looks great as well and then up front we have a 12 inch in instrument cluster and a 13 inch infotainment system running sync 4 and to my surprise this is a little bit faster than most other ford that i've ha that i've had with the user experience so something that i really appreciate is the good integration with Apple CarPlay because I get navigation information on my digital cluster on top of just the infotainment screen. And then obviously we have to touch upon the 28 speaker premium sound, sound system. It sounds really good in here. It's probably one of the best in class. Extremely satisfied with the sound, the audio experience in this vehicle. Next up, we have a big head-up display that, dis that displays not only the speed, but your navigation, as well as the Blue Cruise Adaptive Cruise Control System. Yes, this vehicle has Blue Cruise, so that means it's hands-free driving, which you cannot get in the Grand Wagoneer. And the Blue Cruise on this, to the contrary of the Corsair that we've tested a couple of months ago, it actually works really well. So I'm impressed with this. And what's best about this, even compared to the Escalade, is that if Blue Cruise isn't working properly or if Blue Cruise isn't activated because the road condition isn't perfect, the adaptive cruise control and lane centering system works really well as a substitute. Whereas the Escalade, you don't get lane centering. You still only get lane departure. So it bounces you from left and right within the lane. And then next we have to talk about is the seats. These seats are 30 way adjustable. You can have different lengths of legs because the leg bolstering extends on both sides. It's separate adjustments, which is a little bit excessive, but I appreciate it on a vehicle like this. And the massaging function is also really good in the front seat. It really, it's really punchy for what it is. Now, I think we have to talk a little bit in about the second row and the third row. I'm going to pass it on to Niall and he's going to mention it a little bit. So here's why it's important to test things out, not just go by what's on the numbers, because as we mentioned, the interior headroom is supposed to be greater when it comes to this vehicle. But if I try to sit upright, this is where my head goes. I, I either am pushing into the headliner or I have to like slit, sit down which I don't like to do. I like to sit upright and I can't do it. 
I cannot fit. So despite this having a better headroom for the second row, unless they mean without a sunroof, but I'd be very surprised if you can configure a Lincoln Navigator in 2024 without a sunroof. I just don't fit. And in the Grand Wagoneer, in the same seating position, I've got maybe, like not much, but a little bit more headroom. So this on paper is supposed to be better and it's not. Now the leg room's great. I've got plenty of room here. Center console, everything is comfortable enough. You know, and I know what Victor was saying about having a little bit more width here. I'm not overly uncomfortable, but it does dig in a little bit having the center console here. Despite having a smaller screen, I do have a little bit more functionality. I have a home menu, which allows me to access things like the massage, the seat controls, so heat and ventilation, climate controls, as well as the audio. So that's the big difference here. And I'd say that's really the difference between these two vehicles. Since I can do things like control the audio for the entire car from back here, as well as control things like my massage, the Lincoln is a little bit more to be driven in, whereas the Grand Wagoneer is to drive. So the driver is going to have the best experience no matter what, but the second row in the Navigator has a little bit more going for it. Cup holders, center console, everything's about the same. I do have the controls for the sunroof as well. I can close the shade from back here. So a couple extra features. Again, if you were buying this to be driven in, I think it would be nice, but I just feel that for me, you know, I'm not fit in here anyway. It would not be the one that I would go for. And then the third row, again, keeping in mind that this is just the short wheelbase version, but the third row just doesn't feel as nice as it does on the Grand Wagoneer. Yeah, there's a couple cup holders and a couple options to be able to push the seats, but for the most part, there's more control on the Grand Wagoneer. Yeah, I mean, here's why I always say in the comments, you know, people ask me all the time, how do I fit or how comfortable am I in a certain vehicle? It's why I always say you got to try it yourself because here's a great example. On paper, I was expecting to fit here, no problem. That's not the case. We're going to hit the road now. Let's start off with the Grand Wagoneer, and then we will continue on with this Navigator to try to figure out which non-Escalade you should buy if you're in the market for a $150,000 SUV. We're on the road now in the Grand Wagoneer L. I want to talk about the fuel efficiency first before we get into anything else. We'll talk about how it compares. So we completed our test loop in this vehicle. There's no eco mode. It's just, you know, is what it is. We completed it in 10.2 liters per 100 kilometers, which is actually really good because the Lincoln didn't do quite as well, did it? Yeah, the Lincoln did it in 10.7. But we're thinking it could be weather related. Yeah, today it was really windy, um, so obviously the weather conditions is something that we cannot really control, but I would say these two perform pretty similarly um, in terms of fuel economy. It, it seems like in the city, this actually does a little bit better yeah. um, compared to the Navigator. I've been averaging, you know, 17, 16, 17 around that mark in the city for the Navigator. And this one is... Well, I was around 15 before I started filming everything. We're sitting at 18 now, and that's including about 45 minutes of me filming the B-roll and then us filming outside yeah. and stuff. So so for the most part, it, it did get a little bit uh, worse, but you know, I've been in, in city for the most part. The other thing too with your Navigator is it's got winter tires. So that could affect the, the overall performance of the, the fuel efficiency. So you know, again, we're not doing apples to apples here. This is a long wheelbase vehicle. So there is gonna be some discrepancy between the two, but yeah. just to kind of give you a rough idea that they should be around the same. And then it right. obviously is gonna depend on how you drive. If you're driving like a maniac, then it's gonna get worse. But you know, for the most part, pretty, uh, pretty decent for both vehicles. They're smaller, they're not V8 engines. Both of them are six cylinders, both twin turbo. So performance and everything around the, around the same. More power on this one, but torque, is, uh, is a little bit better on the Ford, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah so I think, I think a big consideration point between these two in terms of powertrain is that the Navigator is more established. It's yep. more of a mature product. It's the 3.5 liter twin turbo V6 that they use in the Ford F-150 Raptor. It's been, it's been along for quite many years now, whereas this one is a brand new engine from Solantis. And so in terms of, you know, future concerns, whether if this is going to present any issues down the line, we don't really know yet. On paper, this engine is more advanced and more, it's newer. It's, it's a smaller displacement engine, three liter, yep. with more horsepower, more torque, and a little bit better in fuel economy. So on paper, this is the better version, however, time will tell in terms of reliability and 
and longevity with these engines. Absolutely, and and here you know, we can't really talk about how that is for for now. We, we know with at least the Navigator, I don't see any major issues on yeah. on the communities with them. We, we've featured a couple of them over the years, and nobody's really talked negatively about the engine performance or, or overall reliability. So, for the most part, that should kind of hold true. But yeah, I mean the the powertrain on this it is going to be a little bit quicker, but this is such a heavy vehicle. By going with the Grand Wagoneer, you're getting that high output engine, so you're getting a little bit more power out of it. And yeah, it it feels pretty good. I've had absolutely no problems getting up to speed and driving around with this thing. I've enjoyed it quite a bit, and there's no sound to it. I mean, it's a quiet vehicle. Uh, the the overall you know exhaust sound there's there's nothing coming out of it. So you know if you're looking for a quiet, enjoyable experience, then this is a good option to go with. Just don't expect that on the interior because we're getting a lot of rattling going on with this thing. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that in a 150 grand car. I mean, not that I would expect any rattling in any car at all. So it's not really acceptable in my opinion with the rattling. Maybe it's just this vehicle, but you know, we don't know. Well, that's what I said too in, in the standalone video that I did on this is, is that it is hard to know if the vehicle's been abused, you know, it's got 14,000 kilometers on it. Journalists have been enjoying it to the fullest with this newer engine that, that Chrysler's offering on it. So it's been around the block. So it's possible that it, it's something with this specific vehicle, but I think it is the rear seats, the, the mechanisms there. As we go over a lot of the bumps, you can hear it. And it's just, it, it is getting annoying because everything else about the interior has been super quiet. You know, there's a good amount of sound insulation on here. I don't hear too much of the road noise. So for the most part, everything is quiet. It's just that rattling. It, it has been getting to me over this week. It's like, stop. I've tried everything. I can't get it to stop. So, you know, yeah, you never want rattling on a vehicle, especially at this price point. Let's give it up to speed here a little bit. No problems whatsoever. That eight speed knows where it needs to be. It's a pretty good sounding engine. It's muted. Good. It's muted, but it sounds really nice. There's a sport mode. I don't think it really does a whole lot, but I've kept it in automatic mode. We have a couple other drive modes, including rock, sand, and mud, as well as snow. Uh, it's nice weather. Can't test the snow features on it, but you know, Jeep has always been a more off-road oriented kind of vehicle. So I, I would expect this to be pretty good if you did take it off-road, except it's got Pirelli Scorpion tires, not off-road tires. So I would keep this completely on the pavement. And that's exactly what this Jeep wants, right? A little oh, yeah. bit of an off-road-esque, but not too much. Nope. Which is why we have an air suspension system here oh, that yeah. you can lift up and lower for all kinds of purposes. Yeah, and you know, I've kept it in aero mode. So when I first picked it up, it was in normal mode. You've got two off-road modes as well. So you've got a couple options there to be able to pull this vehicle up a little bit higher than it is. 10 inches of overall ground clearance, which is pretty good. So I mean, you know, if you're buying this because you've got a cottage, you know, you're gonna be taking it off what I would consider to be very light off-road, then it should be able to do it. But this really is gonna be a pavement queen. This is gonna be your grocery getter. Yeah, if you get the max towing package, you're looking at 9,450 pounds of towing, which is pretty good for a big SUV like this. Yeah, obvious elephant in the room is the Cadillac. You can configure that vehicle with the diesel engine, so you would have a little bit better towing capabilities with that. And that's really where it stands. Like, you know, if you're looking between a vehicle like this and then either the Navigator or the Cadillac, like the Cadillac still offers more of a sport experience with the 6.2 V8, as well as the diesel engine for a little bit more towing. Exterior looks are timeless Cadillac and very sport oriented, but you know, again, our purpose here is to excite you into the other options here. And I'd say that really the, the, you know, sum it all up when it comes to the Chrysler here is you're looking for this because you do like the buttons, you like the tech, you like the future forwardness and the rugged look of it. You're not somebody who is worried about the overall quiet, comfort, serene driving experience. You're a little bit more adventurous, I'd say. Definitely. And you know, on top of that, you get the digital mirrors, which yep. means you can see even if your kids are doing crazy stuff in the back, <laughs> yeah. you can still see uh, what, what car is, is following you. And then also because the size, the sheer size of these vehicles, it's really nice to see that they have included a, you know, little concave mirror that allows yep. you to see an ultra wide view of your surrounding. 
and that has come in handy because the yeah the mirrors are big but you have to decide what you're kind of looking at i always set them up for blind spot so i've got the rear view mirror to see who's behind me and in the lanes behind but then having that concave allows me to see just a little bit more into the blind spot and and i think that's one area where kia hyundai and genesis excel is having that blind view monitor when you turn on your turn signal shows you the camera view i think other brands got to start getting onto that everybody's come onto the digital rear view mirrors now let's start seeing a little bit more of that because i have been looking for it on this vehicle i just came off the kia ev9 and every time i put on the turn signal with this behemoth i'm looking for that and it's not there so i think it's time that the other brands start jumping onto it i think it's going to be an important feature for people looking at this price segment not that we're going to do like a proper dig launch here but you know off the oh my god there we go it found the turbos that was a lot of turbo lag huh yeah yeah it was quite a bit for a twin turbo and about a hundred so not crazy off the live performance that was in sport mode it's a little bit of turbo lag I, yeah i'm surprised quite a bit actually right? yeah so and, and we i did have my foot on the brake so i'm wondering if if a little bit of it was because the car thought oh no person's put the foot on the brake and the accelerator we got to throttle it down so we'll try it again if i come to a stop and we'll just mash the accelerator this time is it going to do the same turbo lag because we do it this is all for science folks we do this all for you Oh, oh my god there we go it's about 27 kilometers the turbos wake up yeah it seems like it's a little it's it's a little worse even they're having they're a little sleep they're yeah. going to bed that's okay though again this is a big vehicle it's not a sport vehicle it's meant for people hey, maybe, maybe they should add the e-torque thing in there well and <laughs> that's one thing that really surprised me I thought that they would have had e-torque on this engine because it is a newer yeah. engine I, I'm that's one thing I'm surprised about and I, I've said it before I'll say it again this vehicle for me has been enjoyable I'm, I've been surprised by it if this was a plug-in hybrid though oh boy this would be a game changer because for me i do a lot of in-town stuff so even if it was only 30 40 kilometers like we've seen on the other jeep 4 by es that would be a game changer but as of right now lincoln doesn't have plans to plug in a fi yeah. the navigator at least on this platform and you know jeep is coming out with a fully electric wagon here but i think we need a stepping stone between the two yeah so i think they've they really need to add a little bit more of engine options here instead of just high output and low output version a diesel would be appreciated yeah. for better fuel economy and better towing capacities and stuff like that a plug-in hybrid would be nice too for a more electrified future a full-on swap to an ev might be something that's a little bit difficult to swallow for the crowd that is trying to buy a vehicle like this yeah range anxiety is absolutely going to be a problem with a big car like this a big suv like this you're going on trips you're going yeah. on long trips and with it being full electric that's always going to be a concern for the next you know five eight years here especially in ontario which is again you know where where it's kind of interesting, you know, if they're, if Chrysler's been taking it slow, that's fine, but, you know, Escalade's got that diesel, and it's not like there isn't a diesel available in the Stella and this family. Use the Eco Diesel, right? And again, you know, I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, we, the, the mentality of EVs has changed in the last six months, and, yeah. and everybody's going full EVs, where I think that the hybrid or a plug-in hybrid, at least as some sort of option, would have been good. So a couple engine options would be nice for this. I think it would help to give people some choice. I know it's not a volume seller here in Canada. Yeah. They're not selling tons of them, but still, like a couple extra options down the road would open this up to some other markets. But we're going to talk a little bit about the suspension here. We're going around our little twisty corners here in the city of St. Thomas. It's fall weather pretty much here and then yeah. the trees have started to, to grow yet so it kind of feels like we're in fall weather but yeah like the vehicle handles it pretty well considering this yeah. is like driving the titanic it seems like the body roll body control is pretty good on on this vehicle with the air suspension right yeah it's it's it is good and that was the only thing we both talked about it when we when we got together to film this that yeah the, the body roll is good on this but the overall suspension on both vehicles it's just not soft enough you feel a lot of it and like yeah. here's this is a pretty crappy bridge so like you're not only gonna hear all the rattling but like i think it just could be a little a little bit better a little softer for what i would want out of a vehicle like this i just when i'm driving this it feels almost too much like a wrangler and that's not what i want at 150k yeah especially the the, the slower smaller bumps right yeah. it's it's where i feel the most bumps in the in this vehicle it's still 
perhaps it's a little bit about the body on frame structure yeah. but you know with an air suspension like this i think a better tuning could be implemented yeah and i, I hope that they can they can do something about it because yeah if you know we talked briefly off camera something like the land rover defender which i drove recently like that's a full-size suv full-size off-roader but it's a unibody vehicle it's not the same size as this even though you can get them up uh, quite high in, in terms of pricing now but you know i feel that the suspension is a lot better on the defender probably because it is a unibody vehicle so you know some things to know but i think what we really need to do now is jump into the navigator see how that compares on the same route and see if we can figure out which one of these big behemoths you should buy instead of an escalade let's get it okay we're in the navigator first of all we have way less screens compared to the Grand Wagoneer, right? Yeah, but I don't I don't necessarily hate it. I mean, I've never liked the tablet style kind of pop yeah. up on these, but for the most part, I mean, again, we, we talked about it as we were on our drive. This is a vehicle maybe for people who are in their retirement or, or you know, thinking of, of downsizing. They, they still want the space and comfort, but they don't need to worry too much about the people in the back. But it's interesting because without the rear screens there, the people in the back are going to be bored, but the massage function on the back seats there, it's nothing to sneeze at. It's not as good as what's going on here. Seats are quite comfortable with all the adjustment and the massage. I think that they're pretty much, massage functionality is pretty much on par with, with the Grand uh, Wagoneer, but the rear massage is a nice feature to have. So yeah, it depends what you're looking for. But yeah, the uh, the interior here is, it, it's it's way, this feels way more luxury than, than the Grand Wagoneer. The Grand Wagoneer feels very tech oriented, but this does feel classy and I'd say it's a lot quieter in here. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree to that. I mean, the powertrain is more developed for comfort. The 10 speed transmission is not fast. It's, it's no. pretty slow, but it's very smooth. So that's amazing. Uh, for a class of vehicle like this. The engine is also pretty muted. Again, very, very quiet inside. And there's no rattling. Wow, that's right. a vehicle that's built well. Well, and we mentioned we're not quite sure why it's rattling, but yeah, I mean, the, there's no rattles whatsoever. This is quite quiet. Uh, it's very nice to have. But again, not as, not as tech tech centric so a little bit a little bit easier i'd say for people to get used to like it is you know kind of what you'd be familiar with minus the shifting on uh, the sort of the piano keys to shift the vehicle in i know a lot of people complain about that just like the rotary knob on the grand wagoneer you know good old sh gear shifter is, is the way to go but yeah i mean everything else though about this vehicle is is really refined and that's i think the big difference to it is a refined vehicle yeah refinement is definitely where it's at um we a lot of the design of this vehicle is very traditional, very conservative, yep. uh, which, to be honest with you, it's probably what audience that would get a vehicle like this wants, right? Yes. They want the buttons, they want the big letters, and it's partially delivered here. I think there are some buttons that are sort of a waste of space and some more crucial buttons that are digitized, which is not the best mm -hmm. for for instance heated steering wheel you have to press menu uh, and then press on screen yep. whereas you know max ac is not something that i really you need a physical time. button yeah you need the heated steering wheel I need button the, more. yeah i need the heated steering wheel button more exactly so i wish they had just shuffled them around a little bit for a more user-friendly um or more thought out um button placement but yeah the, the seat comfort is good the interior road noise is good it's going to come down to how this vehicle drives and performs we did a little bit of performance testing uh, when we were driving out in the grand wagon we're on the reverse circuit of what we just did so you know we're, we're still traveling along the same road but we're just doing it in the opposite direction and we're going to see is the body roll going to be different is the ride going to be different again it's almost apples to apples, but because this is a short wheelbase vehicle, the ride might be a little different than it would be should we have a long wheelbase Lincoln Reserve. Now, one thing that I would say with this vehicle is I'm missing a couple of very, well, expected features, I would say. First of all, um, it's a 2024 model year, and with a car this big and with th three rows, I expect to have a digital rear wheel yeah. mirror, which I don't get here. 
when my when the headrest is up on the third row seats, my visibility of the rear window has shrunk to maybe a television size <laughs> um, from the 1980s. Yeah. So that's not fantastic. And the second row seat is something that I don't really love in a sense where at this price point I expect it to be electric. Yeah, and it, well, not only that, but I, I'm very disappointed that I can't fit back there. But just, you, we were talking about it when we were outside. Yeah. You know, one of the major differences, and again, maybe a long wheelbase of this would happen, but the, the motorized functions on the third row for this vehicle can be controlled from the second row, essentially the doors. You can fold the seats flat. So if you're loading people in or loading cargo in, the biggest thing would be if you're pulling into a parking spot, you have a garage or something, you can't open the trunk, your seats are flat normally, now you got to get three or four people into the vehicle that you normally wouldn't have. Well, guess what? You can't do it because you've got to get into the trunk to access those buttons. Whereas with the Grand Wagoneer, you've got easy access buttons on the second row to be able to flip those over. So just keep that in mind. Like, it's small things. Not everybody's going to have to worry about that. Maybe you're like me, you've got no garage, so it doesn't matter. But just small little details to make a bit of a difference. And again, there's a $14,000, $18,000 price difference between these two. That's, That's where right. some of it goes. Okay, we're on the bumpy road section. Bumpy bridge. This is very obviously more bumpy than, yeah, it than was. the wagon. But is it is it because of the suspension or is it because of the, the, the long wheelbase version compared to this? I think it's the suspension. I think even if we had the long wheelbase, it would probably still feel rougher on there and, and yeah I mean I, I think they were bumping a little bit more right yeah so I, I do appreciate that the body roll is not very apparent in both of these vehicles which yeah. is great however on again on slow speed bumps it's too bumpy for a class of vehicle like this especially for a Lincoln because all you want from a Lincoln is comfort right yeah. if there's no sportiness involved in this vehicle so why not just make it a little a little bit softer? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't mind a bit more body roll because I expect it from a class like this, from a class of vehicle like this anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit too bumpy. I would say on higher speed bumps, it does a better job. Okay. Um, and the roll preview seems to work better on higher speed bumps. It's, it, you can see further ahead and it, and yeah. it better predicts it but uh, the low speed is a little bit disappointing. Yeah, and I, I'd agree with that, because I do, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why we switched up how we're doing this showdown. If you watched our last one, we were sitting you know, front and back seats. So it didn't give us a good idea switching between the vehicles and swapping roles. So this way, we're both in the front seats on both vehicles, we both experience the same thing, and I would agree 100% that, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit more of the road in this than I did on the Grand Wagoneer. So it's, it's, just not disappointing, but you know the Cadillac is kind of the same thing too. So if you want the Escalade to be a similar experience, but it, it doesn't have that same level of refinement that you would get on either the Germans or vehicles like the Lexus LX. Like the the Germans and Japanese do a much better job of ride comfort than, than the Americans. Now we've got a straight row ahead of us. Let's do a little science test. Sure, I love science. Okay, I'm in excite mode. Ooh, that means. A four-wheel drive is engaged, and uh, let's do a little bit of... Ooh, no turbo lag there. Nice. Yeah, it seems like a little less turbo lag, which is great to hear, probably because this engine is ultimately a slightly larger displacement yeah. engine, so a bit more exhaust gets gas to get started. I'm quite impressed with this yeah. vehicle. It doesn't seem to sound as nice as yeah. the... Grand Wagoneer with a inline six, but it holds its own. Yeah, there's certainly no complaints. So, you know, if you're looking for power, you know, big difference really is the tow rating between these two vehicles. So if, if that's important to you, then you're going to want to go with the Grand Wagoneer. But if you want something that, you know, I mean, both of them are about the same efficiency. If you're, if you're looking for the same similar power numbers and stuff, you can't go wrong with either one. I, I'm saying that, again, just like we talked about before, reliability on this is probably going to be better. So if that's a, a concern to you, then, then you know, you might not want to consider the Grand Wagoneer. But 
but to be fair, most people looking at these new are going to lease them for two to three years. Yeah. So you're within the warranty. Who cares, right? Any problems you're going to have, you're going to take it to the dealership. It's going to be there, the manufacturer's problem to fix. So having the extra year of warranty on this could be a big differentiator between the two. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I mean, you know, the Ford, this, this, this Lincoln rather, has been around for a long time. It, it almost helps it in that case that it's kind of tried and true. And the cherry on top is that you get to say that you have a Ford F-150 Racker engine you do. in front. The, you do. absolutely do. Yeah, there's nothing exciting about the engine on the Grand Wagoneer, but that's fine. But I think we are coming to the time now where we got to decide which one we would pick. And sometimes on test drive, we're, we're not, uh, you know, we really don't make it black and white. We kind of say, yeah, you know what, they're both really good. But there's no doubt, if I'm spending this kind of money between these two vehicles, I am buying the Grand Wagoneer, 100%. I like this, I really do. It's comfortable, it's it's quiet, it's what I would kind of like out of this, uh, but I don't think I'm at that stage of my life yet. I like having the tech, I like having the buttons, I like having a vehicle that just looks really cool from the outside, and while this is nice, it's not as cool. I'm taking the Grand Wagoneer, 100% every time. And unfortunately, I would have to agree, I really wanted to root for Lincoln here because it's the cheapest version out of all of them. That's and true. It probably is the subtle underdog, right? Yeah. It should be. But this Navigator is just a little too dated at this point in 2024. This vehicle has been out for, you know, half a decade or a little, haven't been updated in half a decade. Yeah. And really it's in dire need of a refresh, a brand new refresh, uh, potentially with new powertrains and, you know, new looks and new interior and all that kind of stuff. If the next Navigator looks anything like the new Nautilus that Lincoln just released, mm. I'm sure I'll be picking the Navigator. Oh yeah. But we don't have that yet and we haven't seen it yet. So for now, I would have to pick the Grand Wagoneer. The reliability, the extra reliability and the extra warranty is not really a huge concern here just because that chances are I'm swapping out of these every couple of years. So whether if, you know, it'll last 10,000, 100,000 kilometers or an extra 10 years, doesn't really care. Yeah, not for the first owners, exactly. right? That's going to be somebody else's problem. But <laughs> exactly. here's the big question though. Would we take either one of these vehicles over the Escalade? And as much as I like the Escalade, I like that it's it's got all the tech that I would want. It's got the looks, it's got the name behind it. I still think, and, and even though the pricing is better, I still think I would go with the Grand Wagoneer over a comparable Escalade, hmm. which I, surprised me, but I'm telling you, I, I had not low expectations, but I had, I had pretty muted expectations for the Grand Wagoneer going into it, and it really did impress me, and it less, left a lasting impression on me that I wasn't expecting, so believe it or not, I would take it over the Escalade. Interesting. I would take the Escalade with the diesel engine. Ah, yeah. That's something that I would require with a big SUV like this. I wouldn't want to drive a big SUV and spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of dollars on gas. It's not even about the actual dollar amount. It's just I hate the inefficiency of such a big vehicle. That's and true. with a diesel engine, it resolves that. So if I had to pick out of all three vehicles, it would have to be an Escalade, but not just only a, not only just an Escalade, but more of an Escalade with the diesel engine. There you go. So Ford and Chrysler, if you're listening to this video, which we know you are, get your diesels in these vehicles and Victor will buy one. But as always, we get back to all of our commenters as soon as we can. So if you've got questions about this vehicle, you want to know a little bit more about either the Grand Wagoneer or the Navigator, let us know below. We've got videos on each one that we featured within the last couple of years. And obviously with the Grand Wagoneer, we did an episode on that just now. So you can check those out. We encourage you to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and share it online as it helps us grow the channel and provide more free content to you every single week. Absolutely. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.